And so it's interesting, right? That's the name of the game, right? I mean, they're all yeah. digitally, uh, it's organic to them. So if you if you go to them and you don't speak their language, the digital language, right, you're already obsolete. What's up, Aventus Film? You are listening to the third season of Aventus No Season 3. This show is brought to you by Aventus Learning Group, and I'm your host, Myra Idris. If you're an individual who's trying to find your way around the corporate ocean or trying to hashtag up your game with a career, this is where you should be. For today's episode, we'll be discussing the topic of jobs of the future. In the midst of this pandemic, how can organizations and individuals rocket themselves to success as technology advances? Our guest for today is an executive coach and a performance psychologist. Now, over the past 10 years, he has coached executives and leaders from a diverse range of industries, ranging from banking and finance to aerospace and medical technology. He's also coached these leaders and executives across many global markets, such as Europe and China. He is Mr. Han E. Lin. So I think the whole world is going through some sort of uncertainty. And with technology advancing so rapidly, especially with this pandemic in the picture, uh, it is normal for us to think about our job security. So taking the global pandemic into consideration, what is your take on the job market today? Uh, I think the job market is uh, certainly seeing a lot of changes and there's what I call volatility in the system. Uh, what, what I mean by this is uh, what are the jobs that are in demand and certainly the skills uh, behind the jobs. Uh, and of course, there's seasonal requirements and then there's situational requirements based on the pandemic, for example. So there are a lot of uh, changes, a lot of trends that are up in the air right? and a lot of uh, past expectations and assumptions have been thrown out of the window and people are essentially just trying to make sense of where we are now uh, and how the job market's going to uh, shape out uh, over the next few months and even uh, next few years uh, for that matter. So what kind of job do you think will be replaced first? Um, I I wouldn't be able to say so much about the specific jobs, but I will certainly speak to perhaps some of the skills and the the sort of the context, right? So I think just like any other jobs, and whether it's uh, pandemic or pre-pandemic, I think the the jobs where they are not able to add value to the business model, uh, the prevailing business model, uh, jobs that are not able to serve the customer because the customer's needs change, and evolve, right? So, mm-hmm. so when the jobs are not able to, to follow suit. So for example, uh, a couple of years ago, we were in China. Uh, and if you haven't been to China recently, you realize that when you go to a restaurant, when you want to pay for a meal, you can't actually pay in cash, right? They, they, they don't actually accept cash. This cash as a currency is obsolete, right? And so what does that mean? It means that jobs that are uh, in the business of making and printing money uh, out of business in China, for example, right? Because mm-hmm. nobody uses currencies. Uh, so the question is, how do such uh, sort of service providers evolve uh, and follow what the, the market requires? So everything's talking about digital currency, grab pay, I mean, and the, the, there's, there's Alibaba, and there's all these different solutions, right? And there's pay now. And so, so e-payment is, is certainly the flavor of the day. So that's just an example of how how jobs become obsolete based on the market requirements and what the customer needs. So what kind of new and upcoming skills do you think will be very much in demand in the next few maybe years? Yeah, so it's a a good question and an interesting one because I think it's important to put it in perspective in that uh, there'll certainly be new skills that are in demand, but I think it's also just as important to uh, pinpoint the skills that are uh, incumbent that are still in demand. So it's not necessarily like, okay, for example, uh, it's about big data, it's about uh, artificial intelligence, the blockchain, da, 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 crypto. So you need to be able to uh, manage that sort of digital technology and all that. So those, those are certainly uh, in demand now as skills that if you can, you can uh, interact and make use of that sort of technology. Uh, so yes, those are the new things. But I think certainly in terms of skills for jobs, job skills, competencies, uh, things that are still in demand, I think it's become even more important that uh, one must be able to uh, work with other people, a team player, if you will. So, so you're not going to go very far if nobody wants to work with you, right? Uh, so, so whether you're a giver or a taker, for example, your personality 
And so the idea is that you're not able to, to get things done by yourself. Uh, so that's certainly one thing. And then I think this thing about adaptability, right? Being able to think also outside of the box. Yeah. So it's not so simple where a lot of the, the complexity uh, of the business issues requires different stakeholders to come together uh, to give their perspectives. And then of course, uh, whoever who is in a position to make the call and make the decision. Team player, adaptability, thinking outside of the box. Uh, and also, um, I think effective decision making. So these are certainly four skills that will be even more uh, in demand. So you would say technology in terms of, you know, like data analytics, big data and all that will be the next big thing in the next few years. I think it's quite like you can foresee it already, right? But will you say, um, okay, and then you said that we shouldn't undermine our like interpersonal skills and stuff like that. I think adaptability is also very, very important, especially in this time because a lot of things are changing so fast. Like in the next few weeks, everything's going to change again. But with all this like in question, how do we know our jobs are safe? Uh, that's a very, again, a very important uh, question to grapple with because I think, I mean, in my honest opinion, no jobs are safe, yeah. right? So the more you go with that mentality that uh, you want to have a job that will be forever safe, you're already in trouble. Right, so so I think the idea is to approach it with uh, intent to stay relevant, uh, given the the seasons and the changes and even the volatility in the system, uh, and I think that speaks to whether you call it a growth mindset to continuously be open, uh, to get feedback, uh, to stay mentally agile and even in shape, right? Uh, to think critically. And again, whether uh, it's about being able to work effectively in a team or with other people. If you go in with that approach, I think the, your, your job, you'll always be in demand. Let's put it this way. Yeah, that's true. So, so people will always want to have you on their team with their business because that's the value that you bring to the table. And that's something that is not so easily replicated by technology. Right, yeah. So, so I think that's how you can differentiate yourself and give yourself a, a competitive advantage. So you're suggesting that uh, how we can increase our job security during this time would be to basically constantly improve ourselves. Yes, but not in a blind way, right? To, to uh, in a very concerted and a very purposeful way to learn, uh, whether mm -hmm. it's in your own business, in your own craft. So for example, I'm a data analyst. So I want, to, I want to master my craft about managing data, using different platforms, different technology, but also perhaps it's about storytelling, for example. So I will, I will learn about improv, for example, or drama skills, for example. How do people tell effective stories? Because, for example, as an analyst, it's the uh, recommendations. Uh, it's how you deduce and make inference from data to put together a coherent story. Right, so that, that it's a multidisciplinary approach, right? So if you, if you go in with that approach, you, you find that, well, you'll always be in demand because you're, you're doing more than what a data analyst uh, as a convention would, would just do. Yeah, that's true. So off the top of your head, right, uh, what are some organizations that are way ahead of that time? Uh, the, there are some that comes to mind. I mean, I think the, the one that really sticks out for me is actually DBS. It's a, I mean, everybody knows DBS in Singapore. Uh, and and it's, it's quite neat to see their transformation from, I mean, they are obviously a bank, but they are, they are not just a bank now, it's almost like they are a technology business. I mean, they're leveraging so much on the app uh, and, and the interface and experiences okay. that you get when you're interfacing just from the app. And it's so powerful. And that, that speaks to different things, right? You can bring in AI, big data, and all the different complementary stuff. Uh, and I, I see how DBS is really making forays uh, in that respect. Uh, so that's one. Um, ahead of their time, I mean, I think uh, it's very interesting. I was just reading a, a recent article on Sim Wong Hu, I mean, uh, creative technology. So they have really been following a very interesting life cycle of a company, right? From small to big, then now sort of consolidating. And they're talking about some of the technology and the, the sound technology, the sound blaster, but now it's uh, what, FX. Um, and it's just, just interesting how they continue to pivot and adapt with the times, right? So I think there's a lot we can learn from them that I, I feel like they are constantly not just, uh, not just adding value to the present customer, they are also looking ahead uh, to what 
the next customer would like. I mean, now if you think about our current kids, if we are, I think we are in a very interesting intersection of our generation where uh, in the next few years, you'll see really digital natives, kids who have grown up with phones. Like, so in, in my generation, for example, right, we, we didn't grow up with cell phones, for example, right? It's only when we were a little bit older. So there was a, a good chunk of our years that we didn't have technology, but now there are people who have who will grow up and the first thing they see is a cell phone, right? And so it is organic to their experience. And so their, their requirements, uh, their, their demands, their interests are going to be quite transformational. Uh, and I think the companies who can uh, start preparing uh, to understand this generation will be in good shape. So I think you were talking about DBS. I think I also have something to add on up like from my experience using DBS, they've also had like ways where they actually reach out to their own um maybe customers because uh they have like all these like telegram they, they have this telegram channel where they actually post their articles on it and a lot of them are is more catered to the youth or like young adults, working adults. And I think it was very helpful because a lot of them they are really, really very like knowledgeable into like finance stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's different channels, right? So they're certainly yeah. leveraging on social media or, or, or Telegram or WhatsApp and all that because that's where the customers are, right? I mean, if you yeah. don't reach out to them, you don't have those touch points, uh, you are already behind the game. Uh, mm-hmm. And now if you don't, you don't leave an impression with the young, I mean, say from a bank, they will end up with another bank that uh, they already have a relationship with uh, mm-hmm. right from the get-go. Yeah, so for example, uh. I mean, some of the primary schools, the kids are buying stuff from the canteen using their watch, using technology, right? And the technology interfaces with the bank. So the bank that is in that position is already ahead in that because they already have a relationship with this customer. And as they grow and the mileage from uh, eight year old, is, is the, the journey starts from eight years old. So you can imagine how, how much, uh, what sort of value proposition and, and advantage they already have right now. I mean, I think they're just really lucky. Me hearing this right now about how eight-year-olds pay for their food in a canteen with their Apple Watch. Wow, I feel so jealous. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And so it's interesting, right? That's the name of the game, right? I mean, they're all yeah. digitally, uh, it's organic to them. So if you if you go to them and you don't speak their language, the digital language, right, you're already obsolete. Yeah, that's right? true. And so, so and it's, I cannot assume that I understand that language because I didn't grow up with it. Uh, I've acquired it over time with experience, uh, but it's not there's something to be said about how when someone grows up with it organically, uh, how integral it is to them and how they think, how they communicate and how they behave. Uh, it's completely different. It's transformational. What we're talking about right now is maybe how organizations can be ahead or stay ahead of their time externally, maybe towards their clients and customers. But how can an organization stay ahead of their time internally within themselves as a company? Wow, okay, that's a good question internally. Um, well, I think it's, uh, I don't think you can do one without the other. I think they're all intertwined. And so I think the key is to be able to learn and to adapt and to uh, evolve inside out, right? And I think, first of all, it starts with strong leadership who are open, who are intent on bringing the best out of people. And of course, this thing about leadership in this current day and age has changed completely, right? So nowadays, you're talking about remote teams, uh, matrix organizations, uh, influence and persuasion is the name of the game where you, you've gone other days where you can just tell someone to do something and they'll do it, right? So it's about making a business case, having conversations, uh, winning trust, uh, and making a win-win proposition. So I, I think it starts with strong and effective leadership and of course, the culture of it, right? So where... Um, I mean, I think a high-performing team, a high-performance culture is still integral. So where people are able to speak up uh, to say that I disagree, uh, I, this is my view, can we explore this? Uh, so to entertain that diversity and inclusion. So I think the, the spirit behind the diversity and inclusion captures some, some of it, right? But it's not just about race and, and all the different things, but it's actually an operational culture. I think that is integral to have that divergent thinking. Mm-hmm. Of course, it helps to have external consultants Right, uh, uh, or external coaches to come in with a perspective. But at the same time, there's so much experience and know-how within the organization itself. And so there is a lot to be said about how you tap and, and hear them out. And so it could be as simple as really placing an emphasis on listening to people, 
right, and hearing their voice. And so do, do the employees feel that they are comfortable speaking up? Right, so in a town hall, in a, in, a, in a weekly ops meeting, for example, when you ask a question and there's silence, right? No one has an opinion. No, I completely disagree. Every, someone has an opinion. It's just that they're not speaking up, right? And so the question is, can, can organizations uh, sort of evolve uh, into a space where people feel like they own uh, what they're doing and they feel comfortable to speak their mind without feeling judged? And I think that that is something that is quite, it's simple, but it's actually very difficult to do. So it starts from leadership. It's, not, it's a cultural thing. It's a recruitment thing. It's, it's, it's up and down, right? So everything has to... I think I feel very strongly with the part where um, the employees, basically the team members, have to feel like they have a say in what they, you know, like the work that they own. I think that is what gives them a certain sense of pride in the work that they produce. And that's how an organization can actually move forward together. Yeah. Absolutely, right. So Steve Jobs, when he was, uh, I mean, the late Steve Jobs, he had this very famous quote right, about saying, it's his idea about hiring smart people. You hire smart people so that they tell you what to do. Whereas, I mean, if you look at a lot of the organizations, the culture is you, you don't hire smart people and then you tell them what to do. But that, that unfortunately is a lot of things that we see in, in the prevailing organizational culture, right? The leaders are just, okay, micromanaging and just downloading, okay, you follow my instructions. This is step one to 10. And it just completely disengages the employees, right? I mean, you just there's no need to think, just follow what the boss wants. But I think yeah. in the Asian culture, especially like, you know, like in Singapore, for example, I think it's very hard to find people who are actually like, you know, I'm going to own this, you know, job. Basically, like, because we're very much closed off within ourselves that we're afraid to speak up. I think it's natural in Singapore. Yeah, there's certainly some cultural nuances and influences there. But I mean, there's also changes. All right, so you can see a lot of uh, organizations are starting to explore smaller entities or sandboxes, if you will, right? So where, where I mean, where they are able to do a, a bit more freedom, a bit more space to explore, to experiment. And of course, that goes with the culture as well. Uh, so the, it ways to be seen how this will shape up in the next few years uh, and where we can really um, embrace this shift uh, in organizational culture, yeah. But with technology advancing rapidly and a lot of jobs are going to be replaced, this is a bit of a like, um, it's maybe a bit obvious, but I just want to know if there is a hope for job creations in the future with like technology replacing all these jobs. <laughs> hey, well, it's a, uh, I mean, as you can tell, so, so the, the previous question you asked me was, uh, but what are the, some of the jobs that will potentially be replaced first, right? And I think mm. this idea about uh, a few years ago, again, the story of uh, Professor Yunus, the founder of Grameen Bank, came to speak in Singapore. He spoke at NTU. Uh, so he, he is uh, behind this, 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 this uh, micro-lending uh, movement as a Nobel Prize winner. And he mentioned that essentially, if your job is about creating jobs, you will never be out of a job. Yeah. If your job is to create jobs, Right, you'll never be out of a job, right? So I think it speaks to this idea about how uh, we add value to the system, we add value to the customer, and in doing so, we will potentially bring in more people into the conversation, right? So there's more people in the system, uh, and and that adds value, right? And I think if you do that, you will always be in demand. You always have something to do. So it's not just a job for the sake of a job. It's it's for purpose, for a higher purpose to serve the people, the customers, and even the people around you as well. Hi, thank you for tuning into this episode of Aventus Knows, Season 3. We hope this episode will be able to help you scale greater heights in your career, as well as prepare you better for the future. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comment section below. Um, we're just going to end off this episode with a question. If you had one skill that you could instantaneously learn, meaning you don't have to sacrifice your time, you don't even have to sacrifice your money even, like it's going to be free. What skill would that be? Share with us in the comment section below too. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more Adventist episodes and we'll see you next week. Bye!